Hi there, welcome to the Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation channel. Today we're going to speak about the spirit of Elijah and this devotional is packed full of scripture and revelation and understanding. It actually makes me think of uh, the videos that I did with the Church of Smyrna, Remember Me, Church of Smyrna and the Queen of the South. It's just so much packed with scripture and revelation. So I really pray that it's a blessing to you, um, but also that you will most importantly hear the heart of the Father through all of this and what he is saying to us in this time. Um, I just want to get to some logistics before we, we start with this devotional. Um, you will note that I have removed my uh, uh, comments from, or not removed the comments, the, the ability to comment on my devotionals. And this was just by Father's leading. It's not because I don't want to read your comments. They bless me immensely and it's very encouraging. Um, but uh, Father's just guided me to, to take them off um, or not to allow comments. So um, I do have in the description box, I've got my Gmail address, uh, should anybody want to ask me something or uh, have something to say, whatever the case may be. Um, but I've just, for the videos, I've taken it off. also want to mention with regards to the words that Father um, have me uh, uh, doing this videos, you know, like the latest one is called The Rock of Ages, very applicable to this devo devotional as well. Um, I just want to say that when you watch it, remember the context of the devotional that went before it. The, the, the words that he gave me to do in this form, is they come from out of the, the, the substance and the context of the devotional that went before it. And so when you have an understanding of that, then you understand and grasp the weight of it. Um, so it's I don't just put it out for the sake of putting it out. Here's another word. Um, it's all got to do with context as well. Another thing that I also want to mention is that on my blog that I also have a link to in my description box of every video, um, I've got a page there that's called free books and those are books that I've written. It's on the right hand side of the blog. So those are books that I've written and they are for free. It's for it's a PDF format, so you can just download it and read it at your own time. So that's, I just wanted to mention that as well. Okay, so um, we're going to start today with the spirit of Elijah. And um, there's a lot of things that Father has brought together, different puzzle pieces, as I always say, in order to make this picture that he wants to, and this uh, uh impression upon our hearts that he wants to bring so let's just pray before we start this father i thank you for the privilege as i always say to be able to speak to your children um, about the things that you reveal and you want to show us father the enormity of the responsibility to prepare the worker bride um, father you've just come and overwhelmed me once again with this um, the importance of it that we will just take whatever we need to take out of these videos, including myself, um, that which we will need for the time to come. Um, I was just once again overwhelmed by the thought, Father, that there are people that are watching these videos or listening to it that may very well have to be martyrs for you and give up their lives for you and for your children. And I don't know the effect, the words and the revelations, the wisdom that you have given me. I don't know the eternal consequence of that in the lives of those who are watching. The thought overwhelms me, Father. But equally is the responsibility of those who watch. As much as it is for me to be able to speak these things. And so, Father, I pray for earnestness of spirit to understand your ways, because this is ultimately what this devotional is about. It's about your ways, understanding it, and then in that understanding to walk in step with you and not struggle against you unnecessarily, Lord. I thank you, Father, for your wisdom. Thank you for your anointing upon me to speak with authority, with compassion, 
with wisdom, Father, that only comes from you. And I just worship you for that, Father. We thank you and we pray this in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Okay, so we are going to start with um, Psalm 45. Now, Psalm 45 is the foundational scripture of the Queen of the South script, uh, uh, video that I did. And I dissected Psalm 45, and out of that came a, a full understanding of exactly who the Queen of the South is. Now, the Queen of the South is mentioned in Luke 11, where the disciples, it's Luke 11's discourse, where the disciples asked, Yeshua, what are the signs of the time? And he told them that they will receive nothing. This weaker generation, speaking of the generation that we are in, will receive no sign except the sign of Jonah. And then he mentions that he is as Solomon or greater than Solomon. And um, so there's this conjunction between Solomon being as the king of Solomon here and also as Jonah the prophet. So we, we have the king and the prophet dynamic. And um, then he talks about the queen of the south that will rise with the men of Nineveh in judgment, meaning in the time of judgment, to condemn this wicked generation. And if we want to have an understanding of what this wicked generation looks like, we only need to go to the last few verses of Romans 1 to understand exactly the audience that the queen of the south will be raised up. So the queen of the south in short, is basically the Gentile bride. That's why he is here as the king of, uh, 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 of the Solomon, the King Solomon, because he is as the bridegroom with his wife. Okay, so we're going to read uh, just a bit of Psalm 45 and just some more information that Father has shown me with regards to that. So let's go to verse 9. Okay. The king's daughters were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of Ophir. So the first part of Psalm 45 is a description of the king, King David, or in this case Solomon, as we would like to see him. Um, and on his right hand is the queen, right? And she is in the gold of Ophir. Now that right hand in the Strong's means as well south. So she's on the south. So she's the queen of the south. And she's standing in gold of Ophir. And that gold is a type and shadow of faith that has been purified um, in the furnace. And that is more precious than fine gold. We read, um, I think it's in James that we read about that. Verse 10, now he's talking to her. Hearken, O daughter, and consider and incline thy ear. Forget also thy own people and thy father's house. So the queen of Sheba, which is also a type and shadow of the queen of the south, a Gentile bride, has left everything to go to Solomon to receive wisdom. Okay, this is what this is about. And she's left her father's house. She's left her family. In the same way, Yeshua told his disciples, unless you are willing to leave mother, father, brother, sister, even yourself, hate your own life, you are not worthy to be my disciple. So this is talking about the bride that has left everything in order to stand on his right hand as the queen of the south. Okay, so let's go to verse 11. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. Verse 12, And the daughter of Tyre shall be there with a gift. Even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. So the daughter of Tyre is also a type and shadow of this uh, queen next to him. And the daughter of Tyre shall be there with a gift. Okay, verse 13, the king's daughter, talking about her, is all glorious within her. Her clothing is wrought of gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. Okay, so this is talking about uh, the, the, the raiment of needlework, that she's wrought in gold and that she's so beautiful. It's talking about her spiritual disposition who she is in Christ. That means she has left all, forsaken all, to follow him, to stand on his right hand. Now it says the following about this 
this queen, this daughter of Tyra, so to speak. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions that follow her, shall be brought unto thee. So here's this queen, also known as the daughter of Tyre, also known as the queen of Sheba. Right? She's the queen of the south that will ra rise up. She has virgins following her. In the same way, in Luke 11, Yeshua tells them that the queen of the south with the men of Nineveh. So this men of Nineveh are those that follow the queen of the south. They are the virgins. So the queen has virgins following her. Okay. Um, verse 15. With gladness and rejoicing shall they be brought. Who shall be brought? The, 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 the queen with her virgins. They shall enter into the king's palace. Instead of thy fathers shall be thy children, whom thou mayest make princes in all the earth. What do princes do? They rule and reign. So this is talking about the queen of the south, who has virgins that produce children that will rule and reign. Talking about the millennial reign. Okay, so that's in a nutshell. Now, if we take the Queen of the South, that she will rise in judgment, and you consider my previous devotional, Prophets Amongst Us, then I talk about the fact that the Smyrna Church are a type and shadow of Elijah. Because remember, we're talking about the spirit of Elijah. So they are a type and shadow of Elijah, or John the Baptist, that Yeshua said is as Elijah come. Right, so we have Smyrna, John the Baptist, Elijah, Queen of the South, all speaking about the same thing. However, there are the Queen, the Virgin, the Children. Okay, so the Queen is at the right hand, which means South. She stands there. Now that word stands means to be established. It means to be resolute. It means to be strong. It means to have power and authority, and it means she is a pillar. This is very important, that she is a pillar. We find that on uh, uh, Solomon's temple, on the porch, which means Galilee, I think the Sea of Galilee, on the porch of Solomon's temple were two pillars. That would mean Christ, the king, and his wife. She's also a pillar established and strong okay so the virgins the king's daughters right or the 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 queen's daughters so to speak are also considered wives we have to think of jacob who had leah and rachel and their handmaidens that were responsible to produce children right the same with uh, 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 um, solomon the fact that he had many wives there was a purpose behind it because it speaks of the uh, of of the king that the wives const or the 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 woman in his life the the whether it's a concubine whether it's a virgin whether it's a queen all represent those who is part of the bride of Christ the gentile church together with the jewish bride okay so the queen in herself represents the new Jerusalem. So let's go to uh, Galatians 4 and we get understanding of that. Galatians 4 verse 26. But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. Remember the queen has virgins and they are her children as well. And her children produces children as well. Together they form the wife. But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. You remember I did a word that Father gave, Bring my little ones home. This is what he is saying to the bride. She is concerned about the children of her husband. 
Okay, the worker bride. Verse 28. Now we brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. So the mother with her children produce children. The virgins are also part of the bride. So we have a mother or queen and the virgins that are his wives. Okay, so there's a clear difference between the queen and her virgins. Although they form the bride together or the wife together. In Revelations 21, we have an understanding. Verse 2, Revelation 21 verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, that is spoken of in Galatians 4, the mother of us all, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride of the lamb, the bride, the lamb's wife. Okay, then he might as well have said, I will show you Psalm 45. <laughs> and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out from heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone most precious. Take note. She is unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names were written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. So here you have the gates that represent the twelve tribes. Okay, so the 12 tribes are a form of children. She is the mother of children. You can literally see this, this new Jerusalem that is her womb has all these different children in. Right, the best way I can explain it. So part of it is those, the gatekeepers, the gates that are uh, the 12 tribes. And my understanding is that at the gates you would find the elders. The elders were there to teach, and you find that wisdom in Proverbs 8 and 7 and 8 is stand at the gates of the city. So it's a representation of the elders that have wisdom from the 12 tribes that will be there during the millennial reign where Yeshua tells in Matthew, he tells the disciples no longer to go preach, but to teach. Matthew is a type and shadow of the millennial reign or the last part of the tribulation up to the millennial reign. So then they will teach. I think it's in Isaiah 60 or 66, I'm not sure, where it talks about the priests that will teach. Okay, so those are the 12 tribes, the gatekeepers that are formed part of the children. Let's go on. Um, verse 13, on the... It's explaining the gates now, that there are four gates and that there, uh, 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 sorry, let me just read it. On the east, the four directions, east, west, north and south. And on each direction, there are three gates. Together, they make 12. Okay. Verse 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And in them, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Remember the word says that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, meaning everything that happened before John the Baptist came. The church is built on that foundation, but also that which was shall be again. We know that the apostles and prophets will be sent out again. They will build on the same foundation again. They will build the foundation. So these apostles, now, a house cannot stand without a foundation. So the foundation is critical to the rest of the house. Okay, those are the apostles. Verse 15, and the apostles are the other children. 
And he that talked with me and had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof, verse 16, and the city lieth four square and the length is as large as the breadth. We know this is completely a square. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he remember the enemy has the black rock or the black square, uh, uh, Saturn, that is the square, and now we have the new Jerusalem, that's also a square. So the enemy has no originality about him, he copies everything and defiles it. So the new Jerusalem is a square, right? And the enemy has his square, okay? So here is just it's talking further about the measurements. Verse 15, sorry, verse 16. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as his breadth, and measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal, a square. Verse 17, and he measured the wall thereof, and 144 cubits, according to the measure of man that is of the angel. So here we have the 144 cubits, representing the 144,000. Okay. Those of the other children. Verse 18. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. So here's a description of the lamb's wife with her virgins and the children. Okay? Which is considered the mother of all, the new Jerusalem, the queen. Okay? So we find that when it came to Elijah, right, that... Elijah confronted Ahab, who was a king, and he had a wife, Jezebel. And I've said often, also in my devotional teaching, two Johns and a Jezebel, I discussed that this spirit of Antichrist, this Jezebel murderous spirit, is rising and has been rising, but will be more so during the tribulation. And she was a queen, right? So we have that in order to confront the spirit that will be rising up, the Antichrist spirit, this Jezebel spirit, that will be rising up during the tribulation, we have to have an equal force, for lack of a better word, against this spirit. And that is the spirit of Elijah. Because it takes the spirit of Elijah to come against the spirit of Jezebel and cause her to be thrown to the dogs. Okay, so God is working that spirit of Elijah within us in order to confront her. This is what this devotional teaching is about. So what we will have is that there will be the mother of harlots, which is the Queen of Jezebel is referred to, and we have the mother of us all or the mother of virgins rising at the same time. The Queen of the South with the Queen of Heaven. The mother of harlots with the mother of virgins or the mother of all representing the Revelation 21 wife. This is at the same time rising up to condemn this generation in this time of judgment. And we the workers form part of this. And he has to work that spirit of Elijah within us. So the question is what kind of spirit did Elijah have? Well we find if we want to know what kind of spirit Elijah had, we need to go to the Baal showdown. Uh, I think it's in 1 Kings 17, I'm not sure, where he confronted Ahab. He went to King Ahab and um, he told Ahab what he needs to do. He told him, let's get all 300 of these Baal prophets that sits at, the Je at, at Jezebel's table and eat of her dainties. Eat what she brings, her false doctrine, her lies, her deception. These false prophets and teachers, I can add to that, let's bring them all to Carmel and let the God who answers with fire be God. Now, for Elijah to be able to have said that, he had to know without any doubt who God is. That he is indeed the God that answers with fire. Now remember I said the queen of Ophir, she stands in gold. That means she has been 
uh, uh, she has been set apart, she has been uh, 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 burned up by the fire of God's judgment over her own life to be able to stand in purity of pure gold, pure faith. That's why she's standing resolute because she has gone through the fire. The same with Elijah. Elijah once said to Ahab, As sure as the God before whom I stand, it shall not rain for four years, according to my word. So Elijah was in such a place with God that he stood alone before God. And he was able to say, I have such great union with my God. That when I speak, it is his words that speak through me in great authority. That according to my word, it shall be. God shall perform that word through me. That is the type of spirit that Elijah had in him. He knew God and he knew God because he knew him as the God who answers with fire. And God did answer with fire. So we find that the Elijahs, these prophets, remember he's a prophet as well, that will be sent forth, they will be brought before kings. Example of that that we can see in scripture often mentioned, uh, different examples is for instance the, f the fact that Paul was brought before Caesar, the fact that Moses was brought before Pharaoh and Joseph was brought before Pharaoh. Uh, Nehemiah was a cup bearer and he had favor with the king and therefore he could rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Abimelech, that was a eunuch, had favor at the king's ear. He could help Jeremiah out of the pit. So there's various examples. And the most important one is, uh, apart from John the Baptist, who came before Herod, we find Yeshua that was brought before Pontius Pilate and eventually before Herod as well. The same Herod that uh, uh, took uh, uh, Elijah's, uh, John the Baptist's head from him. So the thing with, with, with uh, uh, John the Baptist as Elijah, as Yeshua said he was, is that he confronted, just like he did a, a Elijah Ahab, he confronted Herod straight on with his adulterous relationship with his brother's wife. That that same woman demanded the head of John the Baptist. It's a type and shadow of King Ahab and Jezebel. A type and shadow of the Antichrist and the false prophet. Remember, in the book of Revelation, Jezebel is said to be a false prophet. She's a false prophetess with the wrong doctrine that she's teaching. So we find that Herod is a type and shadow, because he's a king, of the Antichrist ruling. And Je uh, 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 his wife, a type and shadow of Jezebel, is a type and shadow of the false prophet. Talking about the timing mid-seals, where this persecution will take place. And so the Elijah group finds himself within the midst of this having to come against those who are in authority. So we are sent to the lost, to the church, and to those who are in authority. And Yeshua told us this in Mark's discourse. That's in Mark 13. Let's read that. Verse 9. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils. And in the synagogues you shall be beaten. And ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. So all nations is a reference to the Gentile nations. So the time of the Gentiles must come to fulfillment. We find in Romans 16 that Paul is sending greetings to Priscilla and Aquila which is part of the Smyrna group, the overcoming eagles, he's sending greetings and he's saying they laid their necks down for him, for Paul, which is a type and shadow of Christ and for the churches. Meaning, if we think in eschatological view, 
that the church of Smyrna, the, the overcoming eagles, those workers will lay their lives down for the churches. What churches? The Revelation churches mentioned in the book of Revelation. That they will go from church to church. And they will lay down their lives for their children. When they go to the churches, they are going to their children. Paul says that he's in travail over them for his children, that Christ may be formed in them. So this is speaking of those apostles and prophets, those overcoming eagles, to be sent to the lost and to the churches to minister to them. Why? Because wolves will come in and into the flock. This is John 10 time. Uh, where Yeshua says that he talks about the hirelings and he talks about the shepherds and how the, the, the sheep knows the voice of the shepherd and they can differentiate and they will not follow another because it's talking about the wolves that will come in during that time. So the apostles are sent, the apostles and prophets, the Smyrna group, they are sent to the churches to protect the children. And for that very reason, if you consider the wolves that will come in, think of the fact that sheep cannot protect themselves against wolves. What does that tell you about the disposition of the apostles and prophets that has to go in? What kind of spirit needs to be in them to address these wolves that are like Jezebel, murderous, envious? Jealous, wicked, lying spirits that take captive the sheep, the lambs of God. Okay, let's read further here. Verse 11 in Mark 13. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what you shall speak, neither do ye premeditate. But whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye. For it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. So don't, don't plan before. The Holy Spirit will be upon you to speak through you. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death. And the father, the son, and the children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. Your family members, people in the church that you love, will turn against you and put you to death. Who? Those apostles and prophets sent out. They will hate them. Why? Because that spirit of Jezebel will be working within the church. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure unto the end, right through tribulation, the same shall be saved. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand, then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains." So the abomination of desolation standing is talking about the Antichrist, right? The Antichrist, yes, we can see it as the mark of the beast that holds hands with it, but the Antichrist is standing. It, uh, to stand is a place of authority. To, seat, to be seated means that you reign. To stand, the word says, having done all, stand. That means you take a stand for in authority. You stand for what you believe in. So the Antichrist here is reigning. It's a type and shadow. So if you understand that during Yeshua's uh, crucifixion, if you go into the Strong's Concordance in Mark, Matthew and Luke, he had a robe during the crucifixion. If you go into the different uh, Strong's meanings of this robe, you'll find that they have different colors. That's because it's different dispensations and it's also, also different groups. So Luke, his robe in the Strong's Concordance during his uh, arrest was a glorious white robe. It speaks of the bride. In Mark, 
it is a purple robe and in Matthew it is a scarlet robe. Think of the beast, the scarlet beast. Okay, so it's talking about different dispensations, different times, different groups. So now we're talking about Mark. The, the, the bride, the worker bride has now come into Mark, so to speak. She is now ministering to the church during the Mark period. The different churches, Gentile churches, that she's willing to lay her life down. The robe there is purple. Okay, so let's go on. So we can see that Elijah or was bold with Ahab just as John the Baptist was bold with Herod and that cost him his head. So the queen of the south with the men of Nineveh, the queen with the virgins, will rise up in judgment in this time and condemn this wicked generation. She will address the spirit. So I had two visions a while back that I just want to mention here. The first one was about a man that I saw on ground level like this. I could see ground level. He was lying flat on his back and suddenly I moved forward right to his mouth and I saw in his mouth, I saw tiny white pebbles, perfectly white round pebbles and his mouth is wide open. And the meaning behind this is he's laying on the ground because it is a, a place of humility to be low, right? And his mouth got stones in. So when we read in scripture about stoning, we know it means uh, judgment. Stephen was the first martyr and he was stoned. Okay. Um, in John 8, we read about the adulterous woman that the Pharisees wanted to stone. Okay? And Yeshua said that him who have, uh, without sin, let him cast the first stone. And they did it in the Old Testament. So stoning has to do with judgment. Here is this man lying on his back with his mouth open and he's got stones in his mouth, pebbles in his mouth. And the interesting part is, so that talks about the judgment of the bride. So the interesting part this morning, I was speaking to Father about about man that's so fickle, about people that get so easily offended um, and um, so easily hold things against another, so easily take things personally, or so easily write people off. And um, I say to Father, it's weird, sometimes he directs my thinking in order to bring something across. So yeah, I'm thinking I'm bringing this up in my own mind. It's actually the Holy Spirit that's breaking it up. This is why I'm telling you this, because I forgot that I wrote this down about the pebbles. I said to him that instead of us having weight to us, we are like little pebbles in a river. And the moment a current comes that we don't like, we are, you find that the pebbles roll. Pebbles roll. They keep on rolling. Think of rolling stones, right? Roll. They've They've forsaken the cornerstone. That's what the rolling stones are about. So here we find this pebbles and the current that comes, the slightest current and the pebbles are moved. They've got no weight to them. They're not established. And usually we find at bedrock talks about solid, the hardest part, that which have weight, that no matter what current comes, it is able to stand sure. And, and this is what Father wants to work in us is that we are not like these pebbles that's easily taken with every wind of doctrine. Remember, Jezebel is preaching a wrong doctrine and also circumstances that are so difficult for us to handle that are like currents. And because we are not grounded in the word of God and we've not allowed him to work things in us, we are easily swayed. These currents take us away. Okay. So this stone um, happens in the, in, during this time that Lord, the Lord God has brought the number 69 over and over and over to me again. And it happens to mean stone as well. And we've read now in Psalm 45 about the daughter of Tyra. Now the Strong's meaning of the word Tyra is actually H68. Six, five, and it means a rock. So she's the daughter of the rock, right? And it's only when you're established in the rock that you can judge 
those stones that be going to be thrown, right? She's the daughter of the rock, and it's from age 6864, and it means flint, hard, pebble, used as a knife, right? Remember the, 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 Yeshua said in Matthew 7 that we must, our life, when we hear his words and we do them, we are like the wise man who built our house on the rock. So his words are the, are the rock. Okay, so the stones are the word of God that has been tried and tested because we've done them. Those are the words that we will judge them by, the word of God. But we can only do it as we are established on that rock. Okay, another example of that is David and Goliath, where he picked up five stones and representing the law, the five first books, and uh, uh, Goliath was killed with one stone. Judgment. Okay, and so this doesn't surprise me that Father gave me the word um, Rock of Ages that I did that video for. So maybe you can watch it again in the light of what we're speaking about. The other vision that he showed me a few years ago, he showed me a Bible, right? And out of this Bible, all of a sudden, a hand burst out of the Bible. You see the pages opening up, like bursting open like that, and the hand coming out. And all of a sudden, I saw the finger going out like that, and pointing in judgment. So this judgment comes from the basis of the word of God that has been worked in us. Remember, authenticity, reality. Your authority is based on your authenticity. Not just because you can name it and claim it, but because you are the real thing. The, 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 the purity of the word is what pierces the hearts of the people. You speak because of, uh, in authority because that authority has been wrought in you through what God has purposed and planned in your life, what you've gone through with God. Okay, so um, this pointing of the finger right, is the same as, um, it's, it's, it's a reference to the number 12. Now remember the 12 apostles? So number 12 means divine governmental authority. Okay, so the apostles go out with divine governmental authority and that is the Hebrew word lamed or lamad. I think it's lamad. And it's actually, the pictograph is a rod. So what do you do with a rod? You chastise with a rod. Who well, are you going to chastise? Your children. So you have the rod that means discipline, teach, to point out with the finger, to point and um, uh, to, to judge and exhort. So the, 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 12, the, the, the apostles and the prophets that are sent out to the churches are going with the rod of God's authority to condemn and judge the children about that doctrines that they believe. Think of the left behind and the adulterous church, what they are being sent to. So they are going to deal with them ruthlessly. They're going to call a spade a spade. Remember, this is in the middle of tribulation, no time to joke around. Um, so they are going with the rod of authority going to be sent out on the basis of the word of God. Okay, so in 1 Peter 4, we are told that judgment starts with the house of God. Let's read that quickly. That's 1 Peter 4 from verse 17. Where'd you go, Peter? Okay. One Peter four from verse seventeen. Um. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also have once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in... Oh, sorry, I'm reading the wrong thing. Yes. <laughs> 
sorry, going again, 4 verse 17. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer, very important uh, scripture, wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God, commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Let them who suffer according to the will of God. So the judgment starts with the house of God. The judgment starts with those apostles and prophets who have to be able to speak that judgment. And can you speak that judgment unless you have allowed God to judge you? Can you, do you have any right to do that unless you have allowed God to work in you that disposition that is required for the type of persecution that will come against the church in the spirit of Jezebel. He needs to work in us that type of uh, uh, valor, that type of uh, 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 resoluteness and perseverance and endurance and faith to come against the spirit in the time to come. Okay. So the interesting part, if we go to um, the first few books, oh, sorry, the, 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 the churches of Revelation uh, mentioned in the book of Revelation, we find that um, in the, uh, Ephesus, the first church, it's mentioned that their love has grown cold, right? They uh, not grown cold, they have forsaken their first love. Where in the last church, the church of Laodicea, it's just lukewarm. So you see a progression. Remember, we are now, now at the church of Laodicea, so to speak. We're going to again start at the church of Ephesus, representing the apostles and prophets being sent out. So that which was will be again. So once the, the tribulation starts, we are starting with the church of Ephesus. Okay. And the issue that will be addressed is love that has grown cold. But when we come to the church of Smyrna, he says that he is the first and the last. Yeshua introduces himself and he says, I'm the first and the last. We know that the church of Smyrna are those apostles and prophets sent in first and they will die during the course. They will put their necks on the line and they will be raised up at the last day. They are the first and the last. They will be raised up in the last day and they will be kings and priests who will rule and reign and judge. So they judge in the beginning and they judge at the end. They judge being sent out, lay their lives down, and then they judge at the end as well. We read about that in uh, Luke 22. I'll go to that now. So then we have the church of Pergamos. And the church of Pergamos, Yeshua says that he brings with him, he introduces himself to the church, and he says, I'm bringing two swords. So the two swords is that of the uh, uh, the, the persecution of the saints and also we know that it, it's World War Three and all the calamities that take place, right? So here he comes and we find that in uh, the Church of Pergamos he's addressing the fact that the abomination of desolation is standing there, right? So with that we find the Mark 13 reference to the discourse. We know now we are now, right now, where the Antichrist is there. Where it talks about the abomination of desolation standing there. Okay? And he's bringing two swords. We know the Antichrist will persecute the saints for not taking the mark of the beast. But then we get the church of Thyatira. And he introduces, Yeshua introduces himself as one who has a flaming fire coming out of his eyes the flaming fires come in with his eyes and who do we find being addressed there in the church of Thyatira Jezebel so let's read that I think it's important that we read that 
That's in Revelations 2. Verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, number one, and charity, your love, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest the woman Jezebel. So it makes complete sense that he comes as one with fire, because wasn't it with fire that he addressed the prophets of Baal? Right? Which calleth herself a prophetess, showing us it's a religious spirit. This is talking about the Antichrist. Oh, sorry, it's talking about the false prophet. So Pergamos is addressing him who is standing as a seat of authority, the abomination of desolation, that would be the Antichrist with the mark of the beast, right? Then the next church mentioned is Thyatira, and she's the false prophet, Jezebel, okay? Herod and his wife, Ahab and Jezebel, okay? And to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit, who, who does he seduce? The servants, to commit fornication and to eat things unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. That adultery is false doctrine. Except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children. She has children. She is a mother of harlots. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the reins and hearts, the issue of the heart. And I will give unto you, every one of you, according to your works. But unto you, I say, unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put unto you none other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast Till I come. Remember the doctrine. Remember what I've told you from the beginning. Do not lose sight of the simplicity of the gospel. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Here's the rod. Okay. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as I receive of my Father. So Yeshua is saying that those who overcome, they will rule with a rod, Lamad, number 12, authority. He that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit say unto the churches. Okay, so when we talk now about the spirit of Elijah, we are talking about the Smyrna group that are the overcoming eagles that comes in the spirit of Elijah to address this Jezebel spirit that will rise up and they will condemn them with, their, um, with, uh, 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 with the word of God being established in them. Okay, so let's move on. Now we're going to go to Psalm 144, um, verse 1 and 2. Father kept on bringing the number 144 to me, and he took me to Psalm 144, and it makes complete sense. And it's just the first two verses at this moment. Um, let's read verse 1 and 2. Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war, and my fingers to to fight my goodness and my fortress my high tower and my deliverer my shield and he in whom i trust who subdueth my people under me so here we have david and he is saying the lord is his strength and he teaches his hand to war and his fingers to fight so we need to see 
What is he saying here? He is saying, Lord, you are teaching my hand. Think of the queen of the south that is on his right hand, his south. Your right hand person is the person you can trust. It's the person that you know have the character that, that will not let you down. It speaks of faithfulness and a person who knows what's going on. A person who has understanding. Right. You can trust that person. So on his right hand is his queen. She is his hand. Think. Apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist and preacher or uh, shepherd. Pastor, sorry, pastor. Apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist, and pastor. This is his hand, standing on his right hand. What does he do? He teaches his right hand. He teaches them to war. He teaches the fingers to war. Okay, so for what purpose? Who subdueth my people under me. Oh, wait a minute, David. Shouldn't you say, who subdueth my enemies under me? No. Who subdueth my people. And if you go into the Strong's meaning of people, it means my kinsmen. It means my friends, my family. So David is saying, you are teaching me how to rule and reign over my people so that they are subject to me. You subdue them under me. Okay, for what purpose? We'll see that now. So the the word subdue is from H7286 and it means to beat down, to spread, to tread in pieces, to stamp. That sounds like tribulation. That sounds like a very difficult time to go through that. And he's saying, Lord, you are teaching my hands to bring my people my children into subjection and the way you do it is that I beat them down, I, I spread them, I trade them to pieces, I stamp, I bring them into subjection. You do that by not baking cupcakes. You do that by addressing the issue head on with the spirit of Elijah. Think of the timing that we will be going in. Okay. So the hand is a representation of the fivefold ministry. The shepherds that are over the flock. Remember I said the sheep cannot protect themselves against the wolves. They have no chance. No sheep has any chance against the wolf. Unless there's a shepherd that is like a wolf. That's where that painting comes in. I'll explain that now. An equal fierce spirit, but one that is sanctified. Okay. So the fingers, when you judge, remember the vision that I had with the finger out of the word, let's judge. You, with the finger, you point, you judge. Okay. And that finger in the Strong's means to seize or to take hold of, to take captive, to bring into subjection. This is what the apostles and prophets are going to do with the disobedient children of the church. Going to bring them into subjection. Okay. Now, who are the children? Let's go to verse 12. That our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth. That our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace. Now, this plants... That are grown up. When you go into the Strongs, it means to be established and it means to be a pillar. The cornerstones that the daughters are supposed to be also means pillars in the palace. So he's saying, I, the queen, remember the queen is standing on his right hand, which means south, which means established, which means a pillar. She is making pillars by subduing her children in truth, right, because it's about the truth, exposing deception, adultery, lukewarmness, all those things in the church, subduing them in order to make them pillars of faith. This is the purpose of why they are being sent to the churches, that they will be pillars. A pillar can endure 
the pressure from above and below. Okay. So this is why they need to be subdued. Okay. So the queen is next to the king on his right hand or the south. And it means that she's a pillar. Okay. So fingers of this hand, the fingers that are warring, is H676. And it means fingers. But it comes from H6648. And here's where it gets very interesting. It means dye or dyed stuff. Something dyed or a colored cloth. Okay. So these fingers. Okay. Apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist and pastor. They. The, the judgment is to bring dyed cloth. Now what is this dyed cloth? Okay. This took me on a bit of a journey. According to. So I, I went to the. Uh, about the church of Thyatira. Right, and I did some research about it, and this is what it said. According to Stephanus of Byzantium, he called this city Tyatira from Greek, meaning daughter. Remember the daughter of Tyra in Psalm 45, meaning daughter, although it is likely that it's an older Lydian name. Think of Lydia from Tyatira that we read about in Scripture. She was a seller of purple. What did I say Mark's robe was? Uh, uh, she was robed in the book of Mark, the color in the Strongs. It was a purple. Lydia is a representation of the church of Thyatira that was in Revelation uh, 2 talking about Jezebel. Talking about the midst of tribulation. She's a seller of purple. It's this finger that's dyed cloth. You see the references. So it's a type and shadow of the church of Thyatira. During the Roman era, 1st century AD, it was famous for its dyeing facilities and was a center of the purple cloth trade. And during that time, in the book of Judges 5, 30, I think it talks about how the, the women that were taken captive, that they had purple cloths tied to them to keep them captive. So it talks about the church in captivity. In tribulation. Okay, very interesting. So how does he teach us his hands, this fivefold ministry, those who will be sent out, and those, all of us that need to hear this, to war and cause our those that will be under us, our virgins and the children that they produce, the children that we produce in Christ. How how does he subdue cause us to bring them into subjection? So the last video in uh, that I did, the, the uh, uh, Prophets Amongst Us, I was talking about the investment that God makes into a prophet. What, what he puts in, in uh, 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 purifying us and setting us apart. The type of uh, uh, difficult circumstances that he subjects us to in order to make us pillars. So that we can subdue our children, bring them into subjection, that they may become pillars. He brings, he takes us through circumstances that, that breaks us down to dust. Okay, that is the gold brought to dust. He strips us until there's nothing left. So just before I, st Father started working with me with regards to this devotional teaching, I had a vision one morning and what I saw, I saw an altar, like a, a, a big stone altar and top of it was hay or straw and I saw a man lying on top of the altar and leather straps being bound around him. The next moment I saw myself walking also from ground level and I saw me walking with my wolf. Okay, so there's, I've, I've got a strap and this wolf is leading me. That's what I saw. So I'll explain this wolf to you now. I'm walking with this wolf. So what this man on the altar represents is where uh, the Lord says in scripture, he says, bind the sacrifice to the altar. And we know that we are living sacrifices. But many of us have not bound the sacrifice to the altar and what they would do at that time is they would bind it to the horns 
of the altar. The altar had four corners that had horns to it. They would bind the sacrifice to the altar. And many of us, our life, have be we go through so many difficult, difficult circumstances, preordained by the Father, that we are, our life are lived on that altar. We are a living sacrifice. And we are, we grow tired of it. We go, grow overwhelmed by it and we grow offended by God's ways of dealing with us. And we have not tied the sacrifice to the altar and we get off that altar. We've had enough. We just cannot endure it anymore. Because this is the type of thing he works within us. Okay. I remember uh, the other thing that I want to say uh, between the fifth and the sixth seal, we hear in the book of Revelation how the souls under the altar cries out and say, Lord, when are you going to avenge our blood? And he says, just wait a bit longer because the time of the Gentiles have to come to an end, right? And so he tells them just to wait longer. Who do you think are those under the altar? Those who are willing to give their lives up. And unless you are now willing to, to bind the sacrifice, that means your life, your whole being, on the altar of God now and not climb off until he's finished the work in you. How will you be willing in the time to come to lay your life down so that you may be accounted worthy to be one of those under the altar that will rule and reign with him in the end? The first shall be last. And the last shall be first. See, this is what he is working in you. And unless you allow him to work that in you now and bind the sacrifice to the altar, you will not be willing to pay the price in the time to come where the tribulation will be much worse of what you are facing now. Um. About, I'd say about seven, maybe eight years ago, when I moved into this house, I had a, a dream that Father gave me. And the dream was about a whale, a killer whale in my swimming pool. And the whale swallowed me and spit me out, spat me out, and he did it twice. And the meaning of that was that Father was saying that I was going to go through a great time of trying and it will be repeated twice. And it, the reason why it was a killer whale was because the purpose was to kill me. <laughs> the purpose of a sacrifice is to ultimately sacrifice it, to kill it. And so the swimming pool was to say, there's no space. There will be no place to move around. No wiggle space. I won't be able to get out of this. You can imagine a killer whale in a swimming pool. He fills it completely, right? So he was showing me and preparing me that I was going to go through a very difficult time, which I did. And when you think of a whale being swallowed up by a whale, it's in great darkness. In the same way, we find Jonah. Now remember, Yeshua said that the sign of Jonah will come. So, and the queen of the south will rise up with him. So doesn't it stand to reason that the queen of the south who is to judge, like Jonah, who judged Nineveh, that she too herself has to go like Jonah in a time of darkness, in preparation for what is to come? Right? So let's read about Jonah. Let's go to the book of Jonah. And we are going to go to chapter 2. Jonah is after Obadiah. If you have hit Hosea just a little bit further, you get Obadiah and then Jonah. So chapter 2. Here's Jonah. He's been thrown into the sea and he finds himself swallowed up by a, um, by a whale. Okay, a killer whale <laughs> in my case. I just want to get to my place. Okay, let's read what he says. Now, when I read this, you might as well remember Father gave me the number 69, which means stone. If you go to Psalm 69, you will read, it's almost like reading Jonah 2. And Psalm 69 is, is a messianic psalm 
talking about Yeshua and what he went through. So if you read Jonah 2, you read basically the same words. And when I read it, you will find that you will hear your, the echo of your own heart in the difficulty that he has placed you in and working in you. Okay. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. Think of, Yesh Sorry, think of Yeshua that said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This is what he takes his children through that is prepared to be pillars of faith. He takes them to the place where they truly feel that he has forsaken them. And that he will never help them. It's, it's, many have heard of the dark night of the soul and it's a very real experience. The dark night of the soul is where you feel you're in utter darkness and God has forsaken you. Just like Yeshua went through on the cross and felt that God has forsaken him. That's really what he felt. It wasn't just said for our benefit, he went through it. So that when we go through it, the dark night of the soul, we may know that he will take us out of it. Okay. For thou hast cast me into the deep, sorry, verse 4. Then I said, I'm cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again towards thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about, the weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever, yet forever. <laughs> yet as thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thy holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord, and the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah unto the dry land. You see, that which Father is working in you in the difficult circumstances that you are going through is that he's working this death in you in order that you, when that place of death has been reached where all has been dealt with you, spirit, soul and body, and you feel that God has forsaken you utterly and that he will never answer you and it will never end what you are going through. Because it's been so difficult and for so long. My God, my God, why have you forsaken him? That he works that disposition in you where you are like Jacob at Peniel who had power over God and over man. Because Jacob wrestled with God face to face. And what happened is that the angel of the Lord, right? In Hosea it says that it was God, the Lord God that he fought against. It came as a man to him that when he saw that he was not going to prevail against Jacob, meaning Jacob said, I don't care what you do or what others do against me. I will not give up until you bless me. He saw that that disposition was worked in Jacob to persevere. And when that was worked in him, he said to him, you will no longer be Jacob, but you will be called Israel because you have prevailed or have power over God and over man. And that power means to persevere and to endure. What he is working in you now is that to be established as a pillar of faith, to be able to face any circumstances that will come your way because your mind has been renewed and you have been strengthened in the spirit. The spirit of Elijah is worked in you. You have allowed God to judge every part and particle of you. You have been brought 
to dust. And what gets up from there is the, to be able to live by the faith of the Son of God, which Peter talks about. He says, I, or Paul talks about, I no longer live, but the life that I live, I live through the faith of the Son of God. There's a new life that comes out of this death, and it has to be a complete death, utterly distraught with no hope, so that when we go out to those who have no hope, who is distraught, who cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those Christians that are lukewarm, that have left him and say, where is God? We can say, I too have been on the cross where I cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But I can tell you, out of this death, he will bring forth life. And you will be able to say that with such authentic authenticity and power that it is able by your word to raise the dead to life. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. This is what he is working in us. And the enemy, that Jezebel spirit, will not want to allow that. She will hate and persecute the saints. Okay. Okay. So we might ask, you know, why am I going through so many difficult, difficult times? In my case, I've got a daughter that's got 18 years old and she's got five disorders. Five disorders. Five. Number of grace. <laughs> it is a grace that has brought her into my life to make me the person who I am today. Is it a grace? You know, my friend Stacy, she does my transcripts and she... Father has given her words that it's so beautiful. He said to her that she, she had to she has to bless her battle. Bless your battle. And I and I said to her, blessing your battle will cause your battle to become your blessing. What is your battle? Is it a broken marriage? Is it sickness? Is it the death of a loved one? Is it being persecuted even now? What is your battle? Is it sickness that will just never end? You've, I know so many people that suffer from Lyme's disease. It's a torment. What is your battle? Are you blessing your battle? Are you in that place where you say, Lord, I will prevail. I will have power. I will not give in until you bless me. And there is a, an until. There is a point where he says, now I will bless you. But will you hold on? Are you willing to stay on the altar? Are you willing to bite the sacrifice to the altar until he blesses you? Are you willing to get up if you've gotten off? Are you willing to hear what he's teaching you through every circumstance in order to work that in you? I'm going to read something that Isaac Newton wrote. It's a song. I ask the Lord that I might grow in faith and love and every grace, might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. It was he who taught me thus to pray, and he, I trust, has answered prayer. But it has been in such a way as almost drove me to despair. I hope that in some favoured hour, at once it answered my request, and by his love constraining power, subdue my sins and give me rest. Instead of this, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart and let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. Yea, more, with his own hand, he seemed intent to aggra aggravate my woe, crossed all the fair designs I schemed, blasted my gouds and laid me low. Lord, why is this? I trembling cried. Will thou pursue thy worm to death? Tis in this way, the Lord replied, I answered prayer to grace and faith. These inward trials I employ from self and pride to set thee free and break thy schemes of earthly joy that thou mayest find thy all in me. You know, the extent that he will go to work this in you. There is nothing that he will not do 
to work the spirit of Elijah in you because of the children that he wants to save. And there is nothing a mother won't do in order to save her children. Nothing. The queen is the mother of all. Um, one of our greatest reasons why we tend to get off the altar is because of self-pity. It's because it's just too much. And you know, by an extent, people might be able to look at our circumstances and say, you've got every reason to feel sorry for yourself. You've got every reason to say, that's it, I've had enough. Like Job's wife. Job's wife looked at him and said to him, by all means, go ahead and curse God. Give up on him. You know, is this the kind of God you serve that does this to you? No, man, please give up. You've got every reason to feel sorry for you. And you, the enemy will make sure to get people around you to feel sorry for you. But self-pity will not help you. It will cause you to get off the altar. And I have compassion on people that go through difficult circumstances because I've gone through so much. But I majored in self-pity. I, I mean, I was the queen of self-pity. I felt so sorry for myself. Man, a can of worms I would eat in, an, in a split second. Until Father revealed to me that self-pity is like ivy that's in a garden and starts taking over the, the, the garden and that healthy uh, uh, fruit and plants that are there, it starts to suck on that nutrients and steal the fruit that is already worked in you and that self-pity drains the very life and fervor out of you and you start licking your wounds. You start licking your wounds. And I was thinking about this, how my dog, when I thought about self-pity, I thought about my dog that uh, uh, she tends, when she gets arthritis uh, in her legs, a, a German Shepherd, it's like a, from the wolf family, they, they get arthritis and she would lick, 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 lick until it, it becomes sore and it hurts her. And it would irritate me so much, this licking. And um, that evening when I was thinking about it, in the course of the night I'm thinking about this, I woke up at 6.21. And 6.21 means to lick. <laughs> That's the chances. And it's a reference to the dogs that licks Lazarus' sores. So Father was saying to me, I want you to address this. My children are given over to self-pity. He knows how difficult our circumstances are. Imagine Yeshua gave up to self-pity. He knows how difficult it is. But just as the licking of these dogs irritate the living daylights out of me, I hate it. So I'm asking, how does that licking of our sores, of our sorrows, of our woes, we lick them? Because woe is me. How dare he speak to me that way? How dare he treat me that way? How much longer must this go on? That kind of thinking. I deserve better. Who do we think he is? Who does she think she is? I can't believe my children treat me this way. I have nothing. I have no money. I've got nothing. Just poor me. Lick, lick, lick. That's how it is. And this is where the wolf story comes in that Father wants to speak to us about this wolf. You see, that same... I think the previous night or the night after that, I walked into the morning, I walked into the, the large area where my German shepherd lies and she vomited. That evening, she also went back to her bowl and she went to her bed again, went back to her bowl and went to the bed. And she kept on doing it and it reminded me of uh, the scripture in 2 Peter 2.22 where it talks about false doctrine that comes into the church and through this false doctrine that, uh, uh, um, that the, the children of God, they return to their vomit. And it's also like a sow wallowing in the dirt. What does it mean to wallow in the dirt? It's like, oh, poor me. That's that self-pity, right? And you wouldn't believe what happened to me. Now, it's quite weird. It's not something I would do at all. But I turned to my dog. I got so angry with her for running to and fro to this, to her bowl, and not lying down and being obedient, that I instinctively 
showed her my teeth and growled at her. So, what did I what did I just do now? But something happened. It's the spirit in me that caused me to do it for your benefit. It wasn't for me, for your benefit. To bring this message across. Because instinctively I thought of a wolf. When she had her cubs. An alpha wolf. Because the alpha female is also, uh, is also alphas. They would growl at the puppies of their cubs. Not a cub, a cub, a puppy. Yeah. Growl at them. And the way they growl. It almost looks like they're going to devour them. That's how vicious they look. And. And, and this is the disposition that he is working in his pillars of faith. Those that will be sent out to disobedient children. They will be almost, they will be seen as unfair. They will be seen as, as too strict. But God is going to send a rod of judgment on the church in this time. To deal with them in order to save them as a Fire a brand out of the fire to save them, to pluck them out of the fire. You don't have time to play nice when you save somebody. You save them, you pull them, you pluck them out with fervor. You deal with it. So this is what that is about, is not allowing that disposition. And in Hebrews 5 Verse 7 to 8, we read that Yeshua learned obedience by what he suffered. This is what he's teaching in us. Okay, so this kind of, of suffering that we go through in which he's teaching us this uh, 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 obedience. What does that do for the type of judging that will come forth from us? It will produce sharpness. It will produce a discernment that is pure, from out of a pure heart you discern. It will produce compassion and empathy because you've gone through it yourself. It will be as a mother and a father looking after the children who have gone through stuff. It will be out of wisdom that you speak. Okay. And most importantly, what he is teaching us through this suffering, right, is to know his ways. His dealings with us is to teach us his ways. As I think it's in Psalm 25. It says that the meek and the humble, he will teach his ways. He teaches us his ways, but more importantly than that, he shows us who he is. We know him because we walk with him. Because we are enduring. We are the Jacobs that wrestle with him in the dark night of the soul who knows him and has been blessed by him. Okay. So we find that with John the Baptist that when he was imprisoned, that he asked his disciples to go to Yeshua and ask him, are you the one? And Yeshua answers them and say, go back to him and say that if he doesn't want to believe me, at least believe my works. You know, the blind see, the, 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 the deaf hear, the lame are walking, you know, believe my works. And then he said to him, the following, he said, blessed are they who are not offended in me. Here is John, he is imprisoned. Remember, the Smyrna group will be imprisoned as well. Yeah, they are. And they're asking, where is he? And he's saying, blessed are you when you are not offended in me. By how and what I allow to happen in your life. The question is, are you presently now, with what he is allowing in your life, are you offended? Are you offended that he would allow and go to this extent to form your character? Blessed are you when you are not offended. Okay. I wanted to speak about the, the vision of the wolf um, that Father gave me and, and, and all that interpretation. 
but I think I'm going to stop with that now um, because the video is going to become too long and I think what I'm addressing in here is of importance and that we need to to stay focused with that uh, I, I believe that is the heart of what father wants to speak about is how he works in that disposition and so the next video I will talk about the wolf um, and that uh, um, this painting behind me what uh, the prophetic significance of it um, and I believe father will um, further just work that spirit within us I'm just going to pray father I thank you for this word and I thank you that you are the one sitting as a refiner over your children that you have a deep compassion over them over their struggle and their suffering in the same way that you had over Yeshua on the cross you feel what we feel you are invested in the perfecting of your saints the word says in Ephesians 2 that we are your workmanship in order that we may walk in that which you have preordained for us that we may do those works father it's your spirit that is perfecting that work in us i pray father that you will strengthen the inner man of might of every person father that is suffering so much under the weight of your hand that were willing sacrifices I pray father give them understanding to understand your ways give them wisdom work in them that disposition to become pillars of faith no matter what you will never leave and never forsake them Thank you, Father, for everything under heaven, for every purpose, there is a season and a time. You have established the border, the length, the time of every season and know exactly when the time is to bless them, to call them Israel, to call them my prince that shall rule and reign with me. Paul said that this momentary suffering cannot be compared with the eternal weight of glory. At times like these, Father, the suffering seems greater because we lose perspective of the eternal weight of glory. But your word says that no eye has seen nor ear have heard the things that you have prepared for those who love you. Thank you, Father. Thank you for strengthening them, for loving them, for fathering them, for coming alongside them, for giving wisdom. I just praise and worship you, Father. I pray this in the name of Yeshua. Amen.